Hallelujah. We are going deeper. We're increasing our capacity. We're following the leading of the Spirit. Whatever He wants to do, wherever He wants to take us. I have not figured out a way to say no to God and it turn out very well. I have attempted a time or two or three. Maybe to even negotiate with him. Maybe a little less of a yes than complete and total surrender. But it never turns out good. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. It's all or nothing. It's everything. He said, I want you to love me with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your might, all your strength, everything. And the beautiful thing is that there, there's this beautiful exchange that takes place because it's, it's all of me in exchange for all of him. That, that's not a whole lot for him. But that's everything for me. He doesn't get a whole lot out of it, really. But I get everything in him because it's all in him. So when I give all of me to him, all my brokenness, all of my failures, all of my pain, and I give that to him, I get all of his mercy, all of his grace, all of his power, all of his anointing. That's a pretty good exchange. I'll take that every day. I'm thankful for that exchange tonight. Are you thankful for it? Are you thankful that we know it's all in Him? That we have access to everything that we need in Jesus tonight? Praise God. It is good to be in His house. I'm thankful for His presence. and Thankful that you made the decision to be here and to be part of this service tonight. Good to have our young people and our young adults joining us on this Wednesday night. I noticed a few musicians and singers up here hadn't seen on before. It, it, it's good to see that. Amen. Our youth will be joining us throughout this series that we're starting tonight. I'm thrilled to have them. Appreciate your investment this week in prayer and fasting. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your commitment this week. I know God has blessed you and will bless you because of your spiritual investment. We had just an absolutely incredible time around here on Monday night in our first Monday family prayer. Very powerful. There was a tremendous crowd almost nearly as many on Monday night as there are here tonight. It was a, a tremendous crowd. Thank you for your faithfulness to that time of prayer and just a powerful move of the Holy Ghost. Toward the end of that prayer meeting, we had specific prayer, and my wife and I stood in for a very specific need, and I just I felt, I sensed that moment was critical. What I did not know is that God was working hundreds of miles away, and divine intervention took place as I received communication back from from my family and a need that's represented there that at the moment that we began to pray on Monday night God began to speak a direct word I'm talking about the moment that we went to prayer God spoke a direct word. It was a word of warning and a word of instruction, a very timely, necessary word. I'm talking about God knows exactly where we are, what we have need of. He hears our prayer. He responds to the cry of his people. Thank you, Jesus. I'm thankful for your prayer and for your love and support. Amen. We've got an exciting weekend coming uh, ministry weekend with my grandparents. I encourage you to be here Saturday evening for the ministry and leadership session, 6 p.m. And then Sunday, all of our adult classes will be here for Word Connection. So Better Together Christian Life classes will be upstairs here for Word Connection. My grandfather will be teaching and then he'll be preaching 
in our worship service. I'm just working him over, making him work overtime this weekend. And my grandmother, Monday night in the ladies' night. I know our ladies will be blessed. We are beginning a three-week series tonight that I've titled Lifestyle, Principle Plus Practical. And we're going to be examining the Word of God and what the Word communicates to us concerning our lifestyle. I'm thankful that every answer that we need, we can find in this book. It's right here. Every answer that we need. Life has a way of creating some questions that will challenge us, but we can find the answers in the Word of God. We're going to read tonight. Initially, we'll read two verses of Scripture from one from 1 Peter, one from 2 Peter, as we go into the Word of the Lord. And then we will come back to these passages to look a little deeper into those chapters. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Everybody say conversation. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Everybody say conversation. Anytime you see that word conversation in the King James Version, it's a Greek word, anastrophe. In our modern vernacular, we, we think of conversation as some kind of verbal dialogue, but the old English understanding of that word would was much more broad in its application and would be appropriately translated today simply as lifestyle. So we're going to talk tonight for the next few weeks about the lifestyle that we are called to live as born again, blood bought, Jesus' name baptized, disciples of Jesus Christ. There is a life that he calls us to live for him. I'm thankful for that calling. I'm thankful for that purpose. <laughs> Salvation is not just a one-time experience. It's just the beginning of a life that we are to live for Jesus Christ. I want us to pray right now that the Holy Ghost would help us and speak to us through his word tonight. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for your presence that we feel in this place. I'm praying tonight, God, that you would give us revelation understanding and wisdom from your word i pray that you would illuminate the principles of scripture lord god that that apply to our lives that you would help us to apply them that practical application of your word that would enable us to live the life that you are calling us to live i'm praying believing tonight that you're going to speak to us god i want to live my life in such a way that it would be pleasing to you that it would bring glory and honor to your name lord that i could be a witness to those who are around me i'm praying god that your word would be alive in our hearts and, and that we would live it out in our daily lives and we thank you for it jesus would you give him thanks and praise for his word tonight Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. You may be seated. There are 13 occurrences in the New Testament where you'll find this Greek word, anastrophe. Eight of those occurrences are found in the two letters that are written by the Apostle Peter. The Christian lifestyle was of particular concern to Peter, and he would reference eight different times talking about our lifestyle, giving instruction and direction about our lifestyle. When you take a deeper look at this word and the more full meaning of the word lifestyle, it is talking about our conduct, our behavior, the manner of life, a way of life, how we walk, how we deal with others. It has to do with our relationships, our relationship with God, our relationship with our family, our relationship with others. A very literal understanding of this word means this, from down to up, from down to up, an up turning. I, I, I've heard someone speak before about redemptive lift. What happens, what occurs in a life that has been surrendered to God, that there is redemptive lift as every area of life comes in alignment with the purpose 
and the direction of God. This word lifestyle has this connotation of up turning from down to up. It is a change of behavior that results from an upturn or an upward direction that results from inner beliefs. One of my favorite scriptures, the apostle Paul talks about pursuing the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It is one translation says the upward calling, that call of God that, that brings us up. It lifts us up up. I'm thankful for that because uh, there's a lot of times when I'm down and I'm struggling. One songwriter talked about being in that miry clay, but the Lord, he lifts us up and he lifts us, us out. It is that upward call. So this word lifestyle has in it that connotation, this upward call. It is the manner in which holy living is revealed through our actions. A godly Christian lifestyle is the result of understanding biblical principles and applying those principles in our lives in such a way that our actions, that conduct and behavior properly reflects the holiness of God, that it brings glory to his name and that it positively affects those around us. That's what it means to have a godly lifestyle. The inspired word of God is the supreme source of our understanding related to our lifestyle. I am not looking to pop culture to find the definition of a godly lifestyle. I'm not looking to Hollywood. I'm not looking to the philosophers of our day. I'm not looking to the textbooks that are in our schools and our college campuses. But I am looking to the word of God to give me the answers, the direction for living a godly life. It contains everything that we need to know when it comes to our relationship with God and with others. There are many explicit commands in Scripture. They are very clearly detailed. The, the Scripture makes it known to a certain instructions. We are to do this or don't do that. Certain instructions are very clear, like don't murder. I don't think that needs additional explanation. Don't commit adultery. That's pretty clear. There are no gray areas. You can't kind of kill somebody. And you can't kind of commit adultery. There are no gray areas. It is an explicit command in Scripture. Do this. Don't do that. Those are based on biblical principles that support that instruction. And then there are implicit commands. They are principles that have to be applied and that we have to live out. We have to figure out um, how do I take this biblical principle and this implicit instruction and apply it in 2019. And just because a principle may be difficult to understand or challenging to apply in our current culture does not give us a pass. Just because it seems to be challenging or uh, may take some, some prayer and some fasting and some some study and some introspection to figure out how do I apply this principle. It's not an explicit instruction. It's implicit. It's implied. And so I have to figure out how do I make practical application of that. Instruction like be separate from the world. Well, that does not mean to go live in outer space. That is not how we are separate from the world. So what does that mean? It does not mean that we buy, you know, a, a convent or a cabin or some kind of fortress up in the mountains and we all go move there and just stay there and we'll get away from the world. We'll have no electricity, internet, air conditioning. We'll live off the land. I can tell you don't want to do that. You don't want to go there. You don't want to live there. Being separate from the world is not about separating ourselves physically from every aspect of the culture around us. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. It's about influence. It's about who is influencing who. So in this series tonight, the next few weeks, we're going to examine some biblical principles, the corresponding application where the Bible is explicit. We're going to share that instruction. Where the Bible implies a principle, we will discuss the relevant application 
for today. I've used this analogy before. I'll use it again because it just paints a great word picture for you. Principles are like vertical fence posts. That's what principles are. But application is the fencing between those fence posts. It does you no good to put up fence posts if there's not going to be any fencing between those posts. It does you absolutely no good. You can have all the principles in the world, but if we cannot apply them, if the messages that we hear preached over this pulpit and the word of God that we read in our personal devotion and the prayers that we pray and the commitments that we make in these altars, and if, if those prayers and those commitments and this word and the messages you hear do not apply in our daily lives, and if we can't make sense of them, if we can't live them out out there, then we have done nothing more than just put up a bunch of fence posts. With absolutely no fencing in between. There's no protection. There, there's no barrier. There, there's no boundaries. I'm thankful for the boundaries of the Word of God. They are not boundaries to restrict me. They are boundaries to protect me. They are not boundaries to limit how much fun and enjoyment I can get out of life. They are boundaries to protect me. They're not keeping me in. They're keeping a lot of things out that would try to destroy me. I'm thankful for the boundaries of the Word of God, the principles and the application of His Word that protect my salvation. They protect my mind. They protect my heart and my spirit so let's go back let's go back and review the context of the two scriptures we read at the beginning of this message we're, we're going to read from the ESV I read those two verses to you from the King James Version talking about conversation I'm going to read them now to you from the ESV with a little bit more context provided the first text is at the beginning of Peter's first letter the second text is at the end of his second letter. I believe that's important because it's interesting as we examine the content of his instruction to us. One at the beginning of the first letter, the other at the end of the second letter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 13. Therefore, now we're going to come back to this word, therefore, in just a moment because it is an important word. I think it was my grandfather who told me when you see the word, therefore, you need to check out the context and see what it's there for. That's, that's the best the jokes are going to get tonight, so enjoy that one. All right, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Set your hope fully on His grace grace. There could be no greater place to set your hope than fully on the grace of God. If you put your hope in anything else, you're going to be disappointed. But set your hope fully, completely on his grace. Verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father. No, notice the language here. He said in verse 14, as obedient children. Now he, he, he's talking in verse 17 about him being a, a father. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds... Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold. You were not ransomed with possessions. You were not ransomed with finances. You were not ransomed with the things of this world. But uh, verse number 19 says, you are ransomed with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. 
Now, I know that's a lot of content, so we're going to break that down a little bit. The primary instruction in this passage is this. We are called to be holy in all of our conduct, in all of our lifestyle. The sum of everything that we are and everything that we do, we are called to be holy as he is holy. Holiness is one of the most important topics in Scripture. It's referenced over 600 times. When you consider the culture that we are part of today, the carnality, the sensuality, the perversion, the secular humanistic philosophies that are so prevalent, invasive, and militant today, it is critical that we understand the concept of holiness. And it is absolutely critical that we pursue holiness in in God. It is absolutely critical that we pursue holiness. To be holy is to be set apart for a special purpose. It is to be pure in thought and actions, to be free from sin, conformity to the character and the will of God. It's thinking as God thinks, to have the mind of Christ. It is loving what God loves, hating what God hates, acting and living as God would have us to live. That's what it means to be holy and to have a lifestyle that is holy. And Peter, he provides the reasons for us why we should pursue this holiness. Going back to that word, therefore. You have to look into the first portion of that chapter. We're not going to take the time to read all of those verses. But he is talking about the new birth. He's talking about being born again. And so the context of living holy lives because he is holy it is built upon this foundation that you have been born again of the water and of the spirit, that you have a fresh start. The old man has passed away. All things have become new. You have been born born again of water and of spirit and you have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and the death burial and resurrection repentance baptism in Jesus name receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues and therefore because you have been born again and you've entered into a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ there's some things that we need to do some things that we need to be aware of He said, don't conform to your previous life and the passions of your old life. For the one who has called you is holy. Therefore, we should be holy in all of our conduct, in all of our lifestyle. Pursue holiness, first of all, because God is holy. He is the epitome of absolute purity and moral perfection. I want you to understand this about holiness tonight from the outset of this series, that that we are not holy based on our perfection. He didn't say be perfect. He said be holy as he is holy because our holiness is not based on our perfection. It is based upon his perfect sacrifice because we do not produce our own holiness, but we are reflections of the holiness of God through his perfect sinless sacrifice. When our sins are washed away, then we become a reflection of the holiness of God. So this is why we are to pursue holiness and for we are ransomed. Or we are redeemed, not with corruptible or perishable things like silver and gold. Nobody has enough money here tonight to to pay for holiness. Nobody has enough money tonight to, to pay for salvation. We're not redeemed with those things. We're not purified with those things. But with the precious and perfect blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. He went on to say, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. Your souls have been purified and you have access to this purification through your obedience to truth. Verse number 23 says that we have been born again through the living and abiding word of God. We are purified by our obedience to the word of God. We may not understand it all, but we are responsible to obey it. It may not make any sense to us, 
but we are responsible to obey it. And through that obedience, we enter into this covenant relationship with Jesus. It's only possible because of his perfect blood that he shed on the cross. He redeemed us. He purchased our salvation. And through that covenant relationship, we become the temple of God. And as his temple, we have a responsibility What we do in this body is important because this body becomes the temple of the Holy Ghost. Our body is the temple of his spirit. And so we have a responsibility in this relationship with him. So Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse number 18, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But sexually immoral persons sin against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Paul said, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are not your own. You have been redeemed. You have been purchased with the precious and perfect blood of Jesus Christ. And so it matters what we do in this body. It matters how we live. It matters what we think. And it matters what we say. It matters where we go. It matters what we do. Because our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And we are to glorify God in this body. When the prophet Samuel went to choose the second king of Israel and he goes to Jesse's house and he looks at all of the sons that are there and God keeps saying no. And he finally asks, is there anybody else? And Jesse says, yes, I've got one final son, the backside of the wilderness, tending the sheep. And they bring David and he was not very impressive to look at. And God speaks to the prophet and says that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. That is not a a statement or a declaration of a principle that relinquishes us from responsibility of what we do in our body that is visible to others. It is not an excuse to live our lives any way that we want to and say, well, my heart is right. Because God's looking at my heart. You just see the outside, but God's looking at my heart. This is just a statement of reality. The outside is all we can see. We can't see the heart. And if the heart is right, then the actions are going to demonstrate that the heart is right. Because holiness is a matter of the heart. And when the heart is right, that inward purity is going to be evident in our actions. It's going to be evident in our body. Therefore, we glorify God in our body because it's all we have to glorify God. We're the temple of the Holy Ghost. And if anybody else is going to be able to see the work of the Spirit, the work of sanctification, that God is working in me they're only going to see it if I'm living a holy life in the body it's the only way they're going to see the evidence of the Holy Spirit of God at work within us so 2 Corinthians chapter number 6 Paul continues this same discussion verse number 16 what agreement has the temple of God with idols He's talking about this body for we are the temple of the living God. What what does a child of God, a disciple of Jesus Christ, what do they have to do with idols? They shouldn't be messing with idols. They shouldn't be dealing with idols idols they shouldn't have idols in their lives they are the temple of the living God as God said I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people therefore go out from their midst and be separate from them says the Lord and touch no unclean thing then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me says the Lord God almighty separate yourselves remember that definition of holiness to be set apart for God's purpose be ye holy or be ye set apart even as I am holy or God saying as I am set apart God is is the the ultimate 
example of holiness and because he is God and God alone. There is no other God. He is set apart uh, from any other. He said, beside me, there's no God. I've never seen another God. Beside me, there is no Savior. And so God demonstrates holiness for us um, in that he is set apart uh, as God and God alone. And he said, I want you to be set apart uh, like I am set apart. Uh, so separate yourselves uh, from the world. Separate yourselves from the unclean thing. Then I will welcome you. And I'll be a father to you, and you'll be a son and a daughter to me. Separation makes relationship possible. Separation makes relationship possible. We see this principle demonstrated from the very beginning of creation. God created male and female, and he said, A man shall separate himself from his father and mother and cling to his wife. Separation makes relationship possible. And he said, when you separate yourself from the idols of your heart and the idols of this world and the unclean things, when you separate yourself from the relationship that you have with the world and you separate yourself unto me, then relationship is possible. I will be your father and you will be my son and my daughter, but that relationship is only possible after separation. Our covenant relationship with Jesus is our motivation for living a life that is separate from sin, separated from the, the carnality of the world, and separated unto God and unto his purpose. And this relationship motivates us to live in a way that's pleasing to him. It is a motivation that comes from love and from gratitude, not a motivation that comes from rules and the consequences of breaking those rules. If, if rules and the consequences of not following those rules is your motivation, then at some point, that motivation will not be enough to keep you in commitment in that covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and at some point, you will break the rules and you'll leave the relationship. Legalism is believing that following rules will save you and help you avoid consequences. Legalism always produces a behavior that seeks to fulfill minimum expectations. It seeks to fulfill the letter of the law while missing the spirit of the law. It disregards the sacrifice that made our salvation possible. We are not saved by our own works. By grace, we are saved through faith and that not of ourselves. We're not saved through works. It is the gift of God. That is absolutely the truth. However, the Bible tells us that faith without works is dead. So there is a relationship between obedient faith and our access to the grace of God to experience salvation, to then live a life of holiness that is pleasing to the one who died for us. I don't live for him. I don't commit myself to him. I'm not consecrated to a holiness lifestyle because there are rules and consequences for breaking those rules. But my motivation is love for a God who cared enough about me to die for my sins and shed his blood my motivation comes from gratitude that says God has been so good to me and he's picked me up when I've fallen he's put me back together when I'm broken my motivation is love and gratitude <laughs> following a set of rules and trying to avoid the consequences of breaking those rules will never lead to living a life successfully for Jesus Christ. We do not seek to live a life of holiness to be saved. But we seek to live a life of holiness because we have been saved. Because he has washed us and cleansed us from our sin. And love compels us to live our lives in such a way that we will please him. And, and, and that kind of motivation, that motivation of love, will cause us to exceed the minimum expectations. It'll cause us to exceed even the, the basic minimum standards of biblical instruction. Jesus said, your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees or you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. 
Now, I thought the scribes and the Pharisees were the ones that Jesus condemned because they were hypocrites. That is true. But it wasn't what they were doing that was the problem. It was their motivation. It was their why and their how. It was why they were doing it, and it was how they were doing it. They were doing it for the wrong motives. They were doing it with a wrong spirit. And Jesus said, you are nothing more than whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones. You are cleaned up on the outside and you appear to everybody else that you are living righteous and holy. But on the inside, there is nothing but darkness and death. Jesus condemned them for that. But he also challenged his disciples and said, your righteousness has to exceed theirs because they're just interested in minimum expectations minimum requirements they're just interested in doing as little as possible to fulfill the law so they can make it to the kingdom of God he said you got to do more than that he said this and you've heard it said or the rules say don't commit murder Jesus said I'm, I'm commanding you don't hate your brother the rules say don't commit adultery he said I'm telling you don't lust in your heart the rules say love your neighbor I'm saying love your enemies the minimum expectation, the law says, um, just do enough to get by. But I'm telling you to exceed that um, because it's not just about fulfilling the rules uh, and regulations and requirements of Scripture. It's about a love relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, I want to do everything I can to please Him, to let Him know how grateful I am for His love for me. If your marriage certificate is the only thing that's keeping you faithful to your spouse, that's not going to last very long. It's going to take a love commitment that even when you don't feel like loving, you love. Love is not an emotion. I'm sorry to disappoint the first six sections of the church in the middle left section here. Just what? Love is not an emotion. It's not a feeling. Love is commitment. Love is covenant. And when love is our motivation, when love is our inspiration, there is no cost that's too great. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure that my marriage makes it, that my spouse knows that I love her in my relationship with Jesus Christ. There's no sacrifice too great. There's no cost too great. He gave his all for me. What? How could I think that I could give any less? And love compels me to give myself sacrificially. Covenant is made possible because of the cross. And when we look back at the cross, we should be compelled to separate ourselves from sin and to separate ourselves unto God. Let's go back to the second portion of Scripture that we read. 2 Peter chapter 3. We'll read this passage also from the ESV, 2 Peter chapter number 3. We'll begin in verse number 18. So again, this is the end of Peter's second letter. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That's the will of God. That's God's plan and God's desire. He doesn't want anybody to perish. He wants everyone to come to repentance. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Considering this fact that everything that we see, the, the natural world that we're part of, our reality is going to be dissolved. One day this is all going to be gone. What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, 
because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Again, in this passage, we are called to live our lives in such a way that they are holy, that they are godly, that they are separate unto God and to his purpose. But notice the difference in motivation. Here Peter is at the, the very end, the closing of his second and final letter. It is some of the final instruction that he is giving to the church. And, and he says to them, the day of the Lord is at hand. He, he's coming back again and everything pertaining to this life is going to be consumed. And this life that is very much like a vapor, it's going to be over and it's going to be over very quickly. And there will be a new heaven and there will be a new earth and we're going to spend our eternity somewhere therefore what kind of lifestyle should you live when it comes to holiness and godliness and how should you act and what should your behavior communicate about the things that you value so he challenges the church and says be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and to be at peace make sure that your life is pure make sure that your mind is pure Pure. Make sure that your actions are without blemish. Make sure that you're at peace with God and at peace with your brother. Because one of these days, everything is going to be dissolved. One of these days, our current reality is going to change. It's going to be transformed. The church will no longer be here. Everything in this life will be gone. There's a new heaven and a new earth. There's an eternity that we're going to spend somewhere. Therefore, be careful how you live be careful consider the things that you do and say and how you act because there's a day that's coming this is all going to be gone and the decisions that we make in this brief span of time that's like a vapor is going to determine where we spend the next life i want to hear him say well done thou good and faithful servant if he's going to say well done we're going to have to do some good things if he's going to say that we were faithful what are we going to be faithful to if he's going to say that we're his faithful servant how are we going to actively, intentionally serve him? Be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish. And to be at peace with him. I want you to stand with me tonight as we bring this first session to a close. In this covenant relationship with our Lord and our Savior. We have this hope in his sacrifice that he made for us. The price that he paid with his own blood at Calvary. And it is our hope in that sacrifice that gives us hope in a future resurrection. And a future home where we can spend eternity with him. So whether, whether we're looking back at Calvary or we're looking forward to the rapture our motivation should be to have a lifestyle that is holy and godly a lifestyle that is pleasing unto him so whether I look back or I look forward the motivation may be different but the destination is the same I want to live a life 
that is holy and pleasing and acceptable unto God. It, it's my hope in his blood that my sins can be washed away. That give me a hope that tomorrow somewhere there's going to be a rapture and the church is going to be taken out of this world. Everything here is going to be consumed and dissolved. But I've got a hope that I can spend eternity with him. And so when I look back, it motivates me to live a life of holiness. When I look forward, it motivates me to live a life of holiness. Set apart for his special purpose. I'll leave you with one final passage of scripture. It's from the beginning of Peter's second letter, chapter 1, verse number 2. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. This was his prayer for the church. This is my prayer for you tonight. May God give you more and more grace, more and more peace as you grow in your knowledge of him. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patient endurance and, and patient endurance with godliness and, and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. So, dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things, and you will never fall away then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's given us everything that we need to live a life that is holy and pleasing unto Him. I, I don't know what else I could motivate you with tonight. If if having your sins washed away by the blood that he shed on the cross is not enough motivation to live a life of faithfulness, consecration, commitment, surrender, submission, sacrifice to God, I, I, I don't know what else could motivate you. And if eternity in heaven spend with the one who did that, the one that I, I want to look upon his face. The one who saved me by his grace. I want to spend eternity around that throne worshiping him. Just trying to thank him enough for what he did back there. If that is not enough motivation for you to make some simple commitments and a consecration to God that I, I'm going to separate myself from carnality and sensuality and the things of this world and I'm going to dedicate and consecrate this temple of the Holy Ghost to God. I'm going to surrender it to Him. I'm going to be obedient to Him. If that's not enough motivation, I'm not sure what else to do. He's calling us to live a lifestyle that's pleasing unto him and he's given us everything we need he's made the way he's given us access and he's given us the motivation that we need to pursue a lifestyle of holiness a lifestyle that's pleasing unto him i want you to close your eyes all over the sanctuary right now i want you to open your heart to god I want you to open your spirit right now. The Holy Ghost is talking to us. The Holy Ghost is speaking to us right now. 
Come on, his his holy anointing, his his holy presence has filled this place right now. Hallelujah. Be ye holy, even as I am holy. Be ye holy, even as I am holy. The Holy Spirit of God is compelling us and drawing us to die to this flesh so that we can be alive in Him. That we can live the principles of His Word. That we can live a life of holiness. A life that is pure and blameless and at peace with Him and at peace with others.